Okay, so we have here the last step. Uh, electron transport. The last part of this story of glucose being turned into energy. And this step takes place on the inner mitochondrial membrane. We're going to see all the... I've been telling you that membranes are very important for chemical reactions, biochemical reactions, and we're going to see today why and how that makes them important. We're also going to understand why we spent so much time talking about active transport. And we're going to see why knowing about concentration gradients and voltage gradients is, an, is important because all of those things are now going to come to sort of fruition in this little story of electron transport. Okay? So just to recall, you'll, you'll recall that the mitochondria has an outer membrane, but then it also has an inner membrane, and that inner membrane is, is wound like this to increase its surface area. Okay, this is diagrammatic, but something like that. When you see them under the microscopes, the electron scanning microscopes and things where we can get some detail, we can actually see something similar to this. So the inner membrane separates, um, separates uh, basically two regions. Uh, there's, there's the intermembrane space, and then there's what's called the mitochondrial matrix. And uh, movement across that membrane is what creates all the energy differences that we're going to see. So this is what the mitochondria looks like. So we're talking about this black line I've drawn inside here, this wiggly black line, as the mitochondrial membrane. Okay? Okay. So let's just go down here and start drawing that membrane. Right about... Whoops. What happened there? Now I can't go down. There we go. Okay, so right about here. So um, I think the easiest thing to do is to draw the sort of large protein structures first, which I'm going to draw in blue. Okay, so I'm going to draw this sort of roundish protein structure here, like this. I'm going to use a different color, and I'm going to draw this little sort of round dude right here. Then I'll go back to the same color. And I'll draw another blob guy, something like that. And then we have another fella, which I'll draw in green, but I'm going to draw him up above here, like that. And one more of these big blobs, like this. And then over here, uh, we're going to draw something that looks like this. We're going to draw just a little... Actually, that's not very good. Hang on. A little sort of uh, ball-shaped thing on the end, which has to sort of extend below these other ones. It's important that this ball shape area hangs down below the other ones, okay, when you're drawing the picture. Now I'm going to draw in the membrane, the bits. So here's the phospholipid sort of bilayer. So that green guy that I just went underneath, he's outside of the membrane. That's important. And then uh, down here I can draw the rest of the phospholipid bilayer across like this. And then we can put the, um, I'm going to use a thinner line. These are the tails of the phospholipid molecules. Okay. So these large blue structures are just basically big protein complexes. They're called complexes because the proteins embedded in the proteins are other molecules. We're going to look at their detail in a, a, a little bit more detail later. Uh, but they're uh, complexes of protein. For now, that's all we need to know. And I'm going to put a couple more membrane pieces on this side, too. It looks like it's not finished over there. Okay, so there's the picture. 
Now, we have to label some spaces here. So in, um, I guess, purple, I'm going to label, this is the inner mitochondrial membrane. So both the top and the bottom are inside the mitochondria. But this part up here is called the intermembrane space. It's, it's the space between the two membranes, between the outer and the inner. The intermembrane space. And then the part down below is called the mitochondrial matrix. It's inside both the membranes. So it's important to understand that this is two different solutions. And they have two different conditions, right? And this membrane here that we've drawn, I haven't drawn the outer. The outer membrane would be above this. That would be the outer membrane up there, way above here. And then on the other side of that would be the actual cytosol of the cell. Okay? So this is sort of the membrane space, intermembrane space is in between the two mitochondrial membranes, still inside the mitochondria, but then inside here is uh, the mitochondrial matrix, which is inside both. And we're only concerned with what's going on on the inner membrane, which is why I didn't bother drawing the outer membrane. Okay? All right. Um, these complexes have Roman numerals, or they're numbers. Uh, basically, their, na their numbers are one... Oh, I forgot one. Shoot. You're going to hate me. I just realized there's another one down here. I knew I should have looked. Right here, we need a blue one. But he's sort of down below like this, a blobby blue one. Put him in there. Thank God for whiteout. And so this is called complex one. This is called complex two. Right? This is called complex three. And this is called complex four. Very aptly named. What's important to realize is that it, these complexes have different electronegativities. Okay? Their electronegativities are different. So that um, they, are, they become increasingly more electronegative as you go down the, the chain. So 4 is the most electronegative. 3 is slightly less, 2 is slightly less, and 1 is the least electronegative. But all of them are electronegative enough to grab electrons from those molecules that we made, the NADs and FADH2s, from the last step. This last guy, um, he's sort of a... A different thing. He's, his name is ATP synthase. ATP synthase complex. We'll just write synthase on there. And uh, we're going to sort of worry about him later. I drew him there so we wouldn't forget about him because he exists on the membrane. Oh, the other thing I should point out is that... Um, when we draw these nice orderly pictures, we have to remember that this isn't always the case in real biology. There's nothing saying that all of these have to be in these specific positions right in the membrane. As long as they're present somewhere in the membrane, they can do their jobs. And so it's possible that they're not all going to be put right beside each other like this. In particular, the ATP synthase does not have to be anywhere near these other guys. These guys are usually somewhere close together because as we're going to see the electrons are passed through them. So we usually find the four complexes here somewhere grouped together on the membrane but the ATP synthase can, it can be anywhere but we're drawing them here just for the fun of it. Okay so what's going to happen? Okay. Um, remember that the solution above and the solution below are different solutions. So Inside here, in the, in the mitochondrial matrix, that's where the Krebs cycle was doing its thing. And so the Krebs cycle has produced NADH and FADH2. And so when NADH comes near this complex 1, it can transfer its electrons to it. Complex 1 is just slightly more electronegative, and so it will grab those electrons. And when it does, it will pull them in closer, in a sense. So what that means is they will 
they will be losing a little bit of their energy. Where does that energy go? That energy changes the shape of this complex one, right? As we've seen. And the result is that this complex one will become a pump. But instead of sodium or potassium, it's going to pump hydrogen ions. Hydrogen ions are everywhere. Uh, you'll recall that um, water frequently breaks up into H3O plus and OH minus, the water dance. And so the H3O plus has a relatively loosely bound hydrogen ion attached to it. And that can be pumped through these complexes. So let's draw, I guess we'll do red, uh, and we will draw nice and thin. So the first step that we have here is an NADH comes along, and what it does is it, ha it, it goes through here and it becomes NAD. It gets put back down into NAD+, plus, remember? So it's the opposite. And, of course, plus an H+. Plus. But in order to do that, two electrons... So I'm going to put E, electrons, are pumped, are, are carried by this molecule. I'll put a little arrow like that for the electrons. Those electrons are now in a slightly lower energy state. And the energy that they once had has been, is going to be utilized by this complex to pump H pluses across the membrane. So now I need another color. Uh, I'm going to find a nice, I don't know, orange color maybe. Green, blue, purple. How about this dark purpley color? So H plus, actually I'm going to move that. I'm squeezing everything in here, so uh, it's a little bit tricky. H plus is being pumped from here to here. In that process, because the energy of those electrons has been released by the change in their oxidation state. Okay, now we have this little green guy. His name is uh, ubiquinone. I'm going to put a little Q in there. I think your textbook uses a, a UQ. It doesn't matter. It's the same thing. His name is ubiquinone. And he's a little molecule that is uh, found sort of inside the membrane because he's kind of, um, he's kind of soluble. He's that soluble. So instead of being, uh, in fact, what we maybe we'll just make it look like he's kind of more inside there. Yeah. Um, he's basically going to grab those two electrons and transfer them to complex two. Okay? Because he's slightly more electronegative. But the nice thing about him is he can slide. He can slide through the membrane because he's soluble. Remember, this is a fluid mosaic molecule, right? Or a model, fluid mosaic model. So it's possible for fat-soluble things to slip and slide in between, and they can move through the molecules. Yeah, so apparently I said that this ubiquinone pumps to complex 2, but I drew the arrow correctly. It's complex 3 that he's going to pump it to. Okay. Now... When it gets to complex three, the same sort of thing is going to happen. The electrons are then going to be handed to this little guy up here, whose name is cytochrome C. I'm going to call him Cyte C for short. We'll write out all the names after the picture is done, all the short forms, so you remember what they are. And then those electrons are going to be transferred from Cyte C into complex four. Remember that every time they get transferred through one of these complexes, they become slightly more uh, or slightly less energetic, right? Because these are more electronegative complexes and they pull the electrons into lower energy states. So what effectively happens then is that uh, we get another pumping 
at complex 3 of H plus ions. And then again, they have to travel through complex 4. And then where do they go from there? Complex 4 is the end of the road. So if, if not for what's going to happen next, this would be like a big dam. None of this could happen unless there's something at the end that can grab the electrons finally. Okay? Uh, but we're going to draw the pumping action at complex 4 as well. Whoops, and that should have been in the purple color. So complex 4 is pumping H pluses as well. And so guess who the molecule is that's floating around in the mitochondrial matrix? Oxygen. Oxygen has been dissolved in there because we've been breathing it, sucking it into our lungs, and then it goes into our bloodstream. It's carried by our hemoglobin to every cell. Every cell absorbs the oxygen. It diffuses into the membranes. It diffuses inside. Because remember, oxygen's a small molecule. It can easily diffuse. And so inside the mitochondrial matrix is all this oxygen that we've been breathing. And so the final step is this, which I will draw in a uh, green color to make it show up. What happens here is that oxygen grabs electrons. Now, the books, there's two ways you can write this equation. I'm going to write it one way, and then I'm going to erase it and write it a different way. So uh, the textbooks like to write it like this. They like to write two H pluses, which are also floating around free, plus a half of an O2 molecule, right, will come along here, and they will grab the two electrons, or the electrons that are there, and they will make H2O. They will become H2O. Actually, let's not put, let's, let's leave it like that. Water. Okay? When you write it like this, all you're, all you're doing is joining an O to the H's. Um, I like to write it as a double equation. Four H pluses plus O2 makes two waters. I find that without the half, half an O2 just kind of seems weird. But there is a reason why they do it that way, and it's to show that here we've given away one electron. And so to keep it, uh, to keep it sort of consistent, that's how they draw it. So maybe I'll just keep it that way too because it does make it a consistent number of electrons throughout. Okay? So, this oxygen right here is critically important. This oxygen is necessary because if not for the oxygen, nothing would be able to pull the electrons away from complex 4, which means that complex 4 would not be capable of accepting any electrons from cytochrome C, which would then not be capable, and all the way down the chain, it would stop. And all that would happen is this NADH would build up like crazy and go nowhere. The concentration would become very high, and it wouldn't be utilized. But because the oxygen, being so electronegative, can pull electrons, sort of serves as the electron dumping station, then that sort of acts like a suction that draws these electrons through all these complexes, through 1, through 3, and 5, and the cytochrome C and the quinone, which are more like transporters. They're just like taxis that get the electrons from one spot to another. The, uh, the blue complexes are not very mobile. Because they're large, they don't move as easily in the membrane, so you need these little transporter dudes, the quinone and the site C, to bring the electrons to the next step. Now, we haven't talked about number two yet. He's still sitting there, and he hasn't done anything. And we have to squeeze something in there as well. Um, different books show this in different ways, but essentially, the FADH2 molecule that we made has a slightly different arrangement, right? It's a different molecule. So its electrons are in a slightly different setup, which means that it can't hand electrons to complex one. Complex one is just a little bit more electronegative than NADH, 
but the FADH2 is actually slightly more electronegative than complex 1, so it can't give its electrons to a complex 1. So what it does is it gives its electrons to complex 2. So that's the FAD. And I'll put that in red as well. So F, oops, I've got to make that smaller. The FAD acceptor is complex 2. So FAD, 2H, um, H2, sorry, backwards there, FAD, H2, it's going to swing in here like this and give its, um, its electrons to complex 2. And when it's done, it comes off as FAD. So it's actually giving more electrons. It's giving two electrons instead of one electron. And then those electrons are taken by complex two. And they are also passed on to the ubiquinone like this. So complex three is getting electrons from two different places. It's getting them from NADH and FADH2. But because of the slightly different electronegativities of those two molecules, we have to have two different complexes to grab the electrons from them. That's all. And ubiquinone is the molecule that brings those electrons right to uh, trans, uh, complex three. Okay, so what's going on is the process of electron transfer. That's why it's called the electron transport chain, right? So that's what's actually happening, is electrons are being transferred because of the oxidation of these high energy molecules in steps, a little bit at a time. Why do we want it in steps? Well, because at each step, the result of that oxidation, the consequence of it is, of course, the release of a little bit of energy. If you oxidize something, it's going to release energy. Uh, the most common oxidation we know of is burning stuff releases a lot of energy. Heat, fire. Here, we don't have heat and fire. The energy that those electrons had is used to reshape the protein complexes, allowing them to pump H+. So here's the end result of all this. The end result is that up at the top here, you get an increased H+, concentration. I'm just going to put it in a big circle. You can write that in, you can put words, whatever it is. You must indicate somehow on your picture that the intermembrane space is getting an increase in H plus concentration. And of course, down here, I'll do it like this, dash, 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 we're losing H plus. Right? The H plus concentration here is going down. So maybe we'll put an arrow up, down. So what's happening is we're creating an imbalance. Remember how I told you that um, all of chemistry and all of nature for that purpose, or for that matter, is trying to maintain equilibrium, right? Here, we're using the energy that we found in the glucose molecule through a long number of stages to ultimately create an imbalance. We're pushing nature out of balance a little bit, and we're creating this H plus concentration gradient which is also a gradient of charge, isn't it? There will be more positive charge on the outside or on, in the intermembrane space than there will be inside the mitochondrial matrix. And that's the end result of all this. Okay. So now, what's going to happen with that concentration gradient? That concentration gradient wants to go back to zero. It wants to equilibrate, if that's a word. And the way it's going to do that is by making its way back through this ATP synthase on the far right of the picture. But we're going to do that in a separate picture because it's already too complicated here. So we'll re redraw this ATP synthase in a separate picture. Any questions about this picture so far? Can you tell the story? Can you tell what's going on? All right, we're going to redraw the ATP synthase on a separate picture. And we're going to draw it... Um, actually, before I do that, because we're talking AP, I'm going to give you a little more detail. Um, I'm going to, first of all, make sure you know that um, the Q I drew up there 
stands for Ubi Quinone. Uh, there should be an I right there. Ubi, I'll redraw that. My, my pen is too thick. Ubi Quinone. Uh, Ubi in Latin means where. Where are you? Where is something? And it also has the connotation of meaning everywhere. Right? The word ubiquitous, if you're into English language, if you are, are in AP English, are you in AP English, anybody? So what does ubiquitous mean? It means everywhere at once, or the most common, or all over the place. Right? And so that word means that you are movable. And that's why it's called ubiquinone. There are other quinones, as we're going to see, but ubiquinone is the one that can move through the membrane. And the reason it can do that is because it's nonpolar, and it can slide between the nonpolar tails quite easily in the membrane. And then the other one was site C, which was a shortcut for cytochrome C. There are many different cytochromes, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, whatever they are, and uh, that's what that stands for. So those were the two shortcut letters. Make sure you understand what those are. Okay. Now, because it's AP, let's look at each complex in a little more detail. Complex 1. Complex 1 is a protein complex. Right? But it actually contains other molecules inside of it. So I'll put them here, and then I'll put one here. This one, uh, let's see, is called FMN. And this one is, is usually just called FES, with a dot with an S. It's an iron and sulfur compound that is found in there. Um, we're not going to memorize all these. I'm just showing you this because this is what's really going on inside. And then you have your quinone molecule, which is outside of the proteins, your ubiquinone. And then you have also, um, this is where I'm drawing this uh, sort of, I'll show you why I'm doing it this way in a minute. This is two. And this would have also in it FAD, And then down below here, at the same level, is the FES. Okay? And then cytochrome 3, sort of, is, or uh, complex 3, I should say. Like, I'm calling it cytochrome because in the photosynthesis, they're called cytochromes complexes. And I'm, I'm just using up, mixing up words. I shouldn't do that. Here is one called site B. Cytochrome B, which then hands off to... Another FES molecule, iron sulfide complex, that's an E there, F, E, and S. And then there's cytochrome C1, C1, that's a C. And then there's outside here, site C, the one that we had in our picture. And then there's complex 4, uh, the lowest of the bunch here. And it has cytochrome A and cytochrome A3 inside of it. So the only reason I'm doing this is to show you that the handoff is actually a little more complicated than it looks. And then oxygen is the final acceptor at the bottom. So I drew it this way, not because that's how they... This is kind of like the level of... Um, of um, energy, I guess you could say, the free energy level, yeah. So we'll put free energy here. So in other words, uh, increasing electronegativity as you go down. So you can see the pathways. So the electrons are passing along here, and they're passing down here. And then from here they go there, and then they pass down again, so that you can see the, the, the clear change in free energy 
constantly. So these are coming from FADH and these are coming from NAD and they're passed through the complexes to each of these little comple complexes inside, which are just basically complex little molecules embedded within the protein itself. It's, that's why they're called a complex, because it's not just a protein. It's a protein with other molecules all sort of blobbed together inside. And they, they constantly bring those electrons uh, down. So the first two complexes are feeding to ubiquinone, because it's the lowest electronegative, uh, or the high, uh, sorry, it's the highest electronegative, the lowest energy of those two complexes. But then it feeds to complex three and complex four through a series of more complicated molecules inside, and eventually O2 grabs it. Okay? But we're not going to worry about these inner molecules so much. But for AP, you, you might want to you might want to look at that. You might want to look it up a little bit and see what you can find. And I guess we're going to stop here, and we'll do the ATP synthase complex in a separate video when the time comes.